Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the Social Innovation Think Tank, where we discuss the latest ideas and thinking about social innovation. My name is Paul Tracy, I'm Professor of Innovation Organisation at the Judge Business School and co-director of the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation. We have here as well my uh, colleague and co-host, Neil Stott, who is also co-director of the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation and who leads the Masters in Social Innovation that we run at the school. So it's my great pleasure to welcome today's guest, who is Dr. Jeremy Levine. Jeremy is Assistant Professor of Organization Studies and Sociology at the University of Michigan. Trained at Harvard, Jeremy's research is focused on the politics of poverty and inequality, mostly in uh, US cities. He's published on a range of different issues, including uh, the political role of nonprofits in low-income places, inequality and participatory democracy, and the relationship between the racial composition of neighborhoods and government contracting for core services. Now, we invited Jeremy on today to talk about his uh, recent book, Constructing Community, Urban Governance, Development and Inequality in Boston, which was published by Princeton University Press. And the book was based on four years of ethnographic fieldwork, and it looks at the role of private nonprofits in community development policy. And at the core of the book is the idea that the nonprofit sector, or the nonprofit sector in the US certainly has become integral to urban policy making, and that that has led to a series of tensions and trade-offs to emerge when uh, private nonprofits take on uh, the work of uh, providing uh, community services. So a very interesting set of issues. Uh, Jeremy, thank you very much uh, for speaking with us. Um, Thanks for having all, me. I'm, yeah, it's great to be here uh, virtually uh, talking with you guys. Thank you very much. So let me just start off, um, first of all, by asking you to tell us a little bit about the really fascinating field work that informs your book. You know, why did you choose to study community level policy making? And how did you actually go about investigating uh, this phenomenon? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, it was a long iterative process to get from the first nugget of an idea uh, to the final book. It started, frankly, 13 years ago, 2008, 2009, uh, when I started graduate school um, at Harvard. I came in knowing that I was interested in urban stuff generally. What exactly that would mean for research, for a dissertation, I really didn't know. So I was, um, you know, had my ear to the ground, was thinking about any possible ideas. And around 2009, uh, a colleague of mine in my co graduate school cohort, uh, David Haro, who's an excellent criminologist, uh, he actually lived in the neighborhood of Codman Square, which is a low income, predominantly black neighborhood um, in the larger district of Dorchester um, in Boston. So David does really important uh, both community work and research on uh, neighborhood violence and gangs. And he was giving one of uh, the uh, person he was working with a ride home one evening drives down the street in Codman Square, and there's a big sign saying, new transit station coming here uh, in Codman Square. So one day we're just hanging out uh, as cohort mates do, and he mentions this and wonders if anyone in our cohort was interested in issues of public transit access uh, in poor neighborhoods. This was a neighborhood that did not have great access to public transit. It was um, a bit far from the rapid rail stations to get to downtown Boston. It would take a bus or two plus a train ride to get there, a real long period of time. Um, but there was this rail line with no stations, but a new one was being built. And so he said, is anyone you know, interested in this? And I thought, I could be very interested in this. This sounds great. Uh, it relates to uh, issues of urban inequality, relates to issues of neighborhood governance, relates to issues of public policy, all stuff I was interested in. So uh, I then decided, OK, let's figure out what is going on here with the station and what's happening. And so really, I just got to be uh, a omnivorous consumer of every piece of information I could possibly get about this station and what's happening around it. What I quickly learned was that the stations were part of a predetermined from a long time before I'd started this work, a uh, deal with the um, state government uh, to build new stations in an underserved area. But it wasn't just the new stations that was happening. When I Googled around to figure out what was happening you know, around these stations, it turned out there was a lot of nonprofit community organizations that had been advocating for those stations, and in particular had been advocating for those stations in order to coordinate other kinds of development around them. 
Uh, this is in the sort of urbanist space, generally referred to as transit oriented development or TOD, very popular uh, suite of policies that effectively is, is asking how do we build affordable housing with commercial development um, that's environmentally friendly by placing it next to public transit so people are able to get around without cars, reduce carbon emissions, and reduce costs for the people that are living in those housing, right? Um, okay, that's great. That's an idea. But then what do I do to study this? Uh, so Googling around, the first thing that I saw was a lot of nonprofit leaders were quoted in the local press about different development projects they were doing around these new stations. So I figured they're being named. I should start there and reach out, have a chat, sort of see what's going on. I knew that I was more qualitatively inclined. So I, I already knew I was thinking about something that was going to be observational or interview based. I didn't quite know what I was going to do, but I just wanted to learn a little bit what's going on before I could sort of set a concrete research question. So I had a bunch of meetings, had about 10 meetings or so with different nonprofit leaders. And there I also quickly realized something different, which was that there's a lot more going on than just these people that are quoted in the press. There's this whole system of city government and not just city government, but like dozens of city agencies that are all doing different aspects of the housing piece, the public infrastructure piece, the beautification piece, state government doing similar things, federal government as well doing similar things and all sorts of layers of organizations, of funders, of philanthropy, of intermediaries, of consultants. Just like, uh, frankly, a little bit, I guess, both exhilarating, but also uh, terrifying, because there's just so much going on. Uh, and so I, um, during one of those meetings, the fieldwork really started um, kind of by accident. I'm having a meeting with one of those nonprofit directors, Jean Dubois, uh, of an organization called the Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation. Uh, Jean loves to talk about her work. So she's chatting me up and I'm taking it all in. And at one point she says, we're actually part of a coalition of a bunch of nonprofits that are um, working on doing development, not just around that Cotterman Square station that piqued your interest, but a few other stations along this rail line running through, in fact, eight neighborhoods um, six residential, two commercial, predominantly low income, uh, predominantly people of color, so disadvantaged neighborhoods. Uh, do you want to come to one of those meetings? And if you do, here's the contact of the person who schedules all the meetings for us, one of our consultants. Uh, you know, you're more than welcome to join us. And I thought to myself, okay, that sounds good. And that really just started this, frankly, over the course, as you mentioned, four years, iterative process of getting deeper and deeper access, of attending every single meeting I could possibly attend, of trying to understand the path of a project through this system of organizations, uh, who has a say, who doesn't, using any given meeting to then initiate more contacts with other people. So when I started observing, it was with these coalition of nonprofits along this rail line, doing all sorts of affordable housing, commercial development, advocating for the new stations and so on. Part of that work involved public meetings. So then I started attending the public meetings where uh, members uh, or residents, excuse me, of neighborhoods could have a say in what's happening. Um, I got a couple of fellowships to work in City Hall. Uh, where I was placed physically in a cubicle directly adjacent to the mayor's director of housing. Get that side of everything. I was attending so many meetings and following these nonprofit directors as they met, for instance, with their funders, that at one point, a, uh, the uh, community foundation in Boston, the Boston Foundation, uh, was starting a um, evaluation of the work and grants they were giving to these nonprofits doing this work in these neighborhoods. And they were building out that evaluation team. They had seen me attend all these meetings as this graduate student trying to understand what's happening. And they said, that seems like a person that might be good for this evaluation team. So brought me in on that, invited me, right? I didn't even have to ask. And then it's like open up this whole world of what philanthropy was thinking about this stuff. And so by the time it took about two or so years in, the fieldwork had really sort of organically, iteratively blossomed and bloomed, expanded into me trying to situate myself in every particular person organization that's thinking in some way 
about development in this particular area and understand what they're thinking about, what they're doing, and how the whole sort of piece works. So it was a very sort of ongoing from just literally my buddy in my graduate cohort saying I drove by this sign uh, about a station, a transit station, to me sitting in on uh, as many meetings as I possibly could, ultimately hitting close to about 370 at the end of those four years with everybody I could possibly get access to to figure out effectively or essentially um, how the sausage gets made for all this kind of work. That's a phenomenal number of meetings that uh, you attended over those years. Um, I'm interested in how the uh, people that you're observing uh, responded to you. You have a really interesting part in the book where you talk about how uh, you are uh, confused for all different types of people. And in fact, you had a nickname, which I think was Dr. Shadow, because there right. you were always appearing in, into the shadows. Um, so tell us a little bit more about uh, how you navigated that. Yeah. Yeah. So for, um, <clears throat> I privileged, uh, so this is the sort of like uh, more scholarly side of things. I privileged observations over interviews. Uh, in sociology in particular, social science more generally, there's this somewhat of a debate, um, although ultimately like any method, all methods are good and tell us different things. But there is a, a not so much contentious, but a, a debate about interviews where you sit down with someone, uh, even if it's sort of loose formed, uh, and, and ask them questions, they give you answers, um, compared to sitting in, watching them, observing them as they go through their daily lives, do their work. Very early on, I made the decision to privilege the uh, observations over interviews. In part, that is because um, uh, the people that um, I was studying and observing and wanted to understand what they were doing uh, do a lot of press. They give answers to the press often. And um, so two things on that. One is it means that they are very uh, particular about their public presentation. And so I was a little worried that the interviews wouldn't necessarily tell me everything I wanted to know, that they would be not so much guarded, but would be portraying something, portraying an image they want to portray. Again, these people, not just press, but also like master students. So there's a sort of like, there, there's a, um, a rhythm and a flow to how they gave interviews. And when I talked to them originally, I'd sort of, you know, didn't feel like I got as deep as I wanted to. And in fact, this bore out when I started to do those observations. And in fact, some of those observations actually involved me observing them talk about their work to people of the press uh, and consultants. And frankly, there was a quite large gap between how they portrayed themselves and what they did. Sometimes that wasn't like a, that's not like a, I don't mean to say that's sort of a, a big deal or, or like a um, you know, sneaky kind of thing. It was more just like, there's a lot of mundanity that I found very important and interesting that, on, that when you're asking someone about the work they do, it just doesn't really come up. It's sort of taken for granted. And I wanted to know those taken for granted things. Um, so what that meant was, is that I then ended up being a bit more uh, on the uh, observational side, more uh, sort of observer sitting in the corner than the more active participant observer that often we see in ethnographic texts. So in ethnography, it runs the range from, again, people just sort of doing what I did, like uh, 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 sometimes even just sitting back observing public space, not really interacting oneself, um, to um, one end of the extreme to another end, being like an active participant. Like I, uh, a colleague of mine, just Josh Syme wrote an excellent book about um, uh, um, uh, ambulance, the ambulance and the ambulance drivers. And he himself was an EMT driving an ambulance for part of his field work. So that's sort of one end. I was way more, uh, excuse me, way more on the side of the sort of observations. And, and as you alluded to, what that meant was, was that like, I just was always there, but sometimes kind of forgotten about. So I was always there and I was always clear on what I was about. I'm a PhD student, sociology. Um, like I said earlier, I would tell them, I want to see how the sausage gets made. I didn't necessarily, and frankly, it's true. I didn't really have top down questions per se. They sort of came to me as I was going. Uh, and so uh, that meant that people saw me in a lot of different places. They saw me at a foundation offices. They saw me uh, in uh, the, a federal office building, federal government office building in Boston. They saw me at a conference room. They saw me out in public at a community meeting. Uh, and so I like to wait. 
and I didn't like to sort of say right uh, from the get up who I am introduce myself. I like the partly personality thing, you know, uh, as much as like, I'm probably going to come off now. Like I you know, like to talk in reality. I kind of like to sort of take a step back personally, like a little bit more introverted. So I just waited for them to place me before I would um, explain who I am, what I'm all about. And as a result, people just had a number of different ways to sort of understand my presence in this field. If I got a ride to a meeting with a nonprofit director, they're like, oh, are you, you're working at the nonprofit now? Um, if I went to a community meeting, they were like, oh, are you a resident of this particular neighborhood? No. Uh, residents would ask me, oh, are you a state official? Because sometimes I came wearing like more business casual or business professional, depending on what I was doing before getting to that meeting. Uh, and they'd be like, oh, so you're a state official, right? I'm like, no. Uh, so a lot of different spaces I was placed in. Um, that was very interesting for a lot of reasons. But the big one is because it just showed, I think, how varied and variegated this field of different organizations was. All the different people that I was confused for placed as revealed in many ways all of the different um, uh, sort of players that were involved. And at some point also, it was a really good check by the end. It was a good check that I was doing um, I was getting a lot of good access and that I was getting close to saturation because there was actually a time, and this is actually, I mentioned this in a footnote of the methods appendix. So it's kind of buried in the text, but it was really interesting that at one point, a, a city government official was saying and explaining how I just was showing up everywhere. She said it was like, like a bad penny that you keep showing up like in the couch or kind of is always like showing up um, around your house. And then she said, you know, I'd, I'd be going to this place and that place and I'd see him there and there. And at one point she said, you know, I'd be at this nonprofit and there he is. In fact, I've never, I, you know, because I kept diligent notes, I know that I had never been at that nonprofit when she had been there. We had never overlapped there. But that alone ended up being a good check on how much at least the people that I was trying to follow assumed that I was everywhere you could be when even a place I wasn't, I was assumed to be at. Uh, so, that, so it ended up being very fruitful, both analytically, um, but also almost as a check that by 2013, 2014, uh, people just assumed that I was basically everywhere. So it made me feel more confident that I was getting pretty deep uh, into the work. Great, thank you. So moving on a little bit from the, the methods that you use to, to collect your data to some of the core, the core argumentation. So one of the key points that you make in the book is that the boundaries between the public, the for-profit, the non-profit sector uh, is blurred to the point of imperceptibility. Could you say a little bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, Part of that idea is actually um, built on and sort of extending a foundational text <clears throat> in the social welfare literature. This is Smith and Lipsky's Nonprofits for Hire. Uh, excellent book uh, written like now, got almost like 25, 30 years ago, but still just as relevant as it was back in 93 or whenever it was first published. Uh, and the core argument there is that uh, in the U.S. in particular, social welfare provision, uh, social services in particular, uh, is not so much a direct government um, uh, benefit or service that the government is administrating and putting together. That a big part of social service provision is contracting. Government contracting out to nonprofit service providers, right? That's the nonprofits for hire play on words of their title. Uh, hiring them to effectively fulfill the duties of public governance, to actually do the social service provision. And so that insight or that, or that uh, empirical reality that they uncover, I think, really persuasively leads to, I think, a larger theoretical insight about what the boundaries of the state are, where the reach of the state is. And there's a really great provocative, in some ways, tension that they reveal which is, um, they call this like the uh, third party government. So basically it's nonprofits, third, the third sector as others describe it, um, fulfilling the, the, the sort of uh, obligations and responsibilities of government. And so it's a question of, uh, particularly in the US, it's become so powerful because it speaks to both 
liberals and conservatives. For conservatives, it's outsourcing government. In some ways, it's reducing the size and scope of the state by you know, offloading it on to the local community, local nonprofits to handle it themselves. Uh, on the liberal side, it has, just, it has almost the same appeal or, or at least the similar amount of appeal insofar it is the local that seems to like know communities better, can better be flexible and, and respond to needs. Uh, so it hits both sides. And so it's basically foundational to governance. And so it be, presents a really interesting tension in the case of contracting, which is to what extent is it the government reducing its role in society, uh, in people's everyday lives, or through the act of contracting, is government actually extending itself into nonprofits by dictating, by creating requirements on what it takes for nonprofits to fulfill uh, the obligations of those contracts? They have to, you know, uh, do what, what government says. They become reliant on government funding. Uh, and so how independent are they ultimately at the end of the day? And so, it again, uh, um, what to me then that, that speaks to is this really, I think, core quintessential tension um, about where the boundaries of the state are. And so when I look at the case uh, that I studied uh, in Boston, in this rail corridor with all this sorts of development involving all levels of government, nonprofits, philanthropy, consultants, and so on, uh, corporate philanthropy um, for the for-profit side of it, uh, it is in some ways emblematic of a much larger disposition where we see if governance is our object, right? If the public services, public responsibility um, is sort of our object of analysis that we care about, we want to understand. Uh, the players that are involved in that are all of these different sectors. Um, for anyone that studies international development, this is going to be, this is, a, this is obvious, right? It's a no-brainer, right? INGOs, the world of NGOs, um, which is sort of the equivalent of what we might call nonprofits in urban neighborhoods, same idea, fulfilling the duties uh, often where states can't. So um, what I looked at basically was, in some ways, this case is emblematic of this much larger system where the people and organizations are involved in this are so varied. And so the role of the state and where the state fits in, this is the blurring to the point of imperceptibility. It's not so much like it's you have sort of separate silos. I mean, even the level of meetings where people are sort of sitting together around the table, you could have all different sorts of people at that table not just sort of people that are involved in, in this work, um, just shows that the, the sort of functions of governance, right? The functions of government are involving a lot of different players than just government. This is why governance has become such a really important concept. It, I think, captures um, that, that the roles of government that we might figure are sort of responsibilities of the state now involve a lot of different people, um, either competing with the state or um, sort of welcomed by the state. I think philanthropy is, uh, in some ways, the most, um, not so much obvious, but uh, prevalent case of this, where I think the public discussion of philanthropy has been elevated recently, so now a lot of people are thinking about this, where you have people that made a lot of money from their corporate work that are putting a lot of the money into philanthropy and that are effectively doing a lot of things that are in many ways either competing or taking over government responsibilities. Uh, San Francisco General Hospital is no longer called San Francisco General Hospital. It's called the Chan Zuckerberg Hospital. Uh, in Seattle, uh, the, you can't talk about education, public education in Seattle without talking about the Gates, the Gates Foundation and Bill Gates in particular and the whims of Bill Gates vis-a-vis -vis his foundation. So when we're thinking about and want to understand um, public service provision, whether it's affordable housing or social services, government is not the end of that conversation. Nonprofits are not the end of that conversation. Uh, uh, go, uh, uh, sort of for-profit work in that space is not the end of the conversation. You got to think about all of them. And that's really what that line uh, is trying to capture. Thank you. So many people, including in the UK, would say that um, community involvement in local democracy and social and economic development is a good thing, full stop. But what intrigued me about your book is you surface and you worry about some unintended consequences of the approach you just described. Um, what, are the, what are they and why should we be concerned? Right. Yeah, 
excellent question. Yeah. Uh, so I am also interested and care about those things full stop as well. And part of the book is really written for others like me uh, uh, and the folks that you mentioned or alluded to uh, who have this sort of inclination to value the community in social and economic processes, uh, particularly development. Um, and it's sort of like, okay, if that's the case, what does that mean in practice? How is that working in practice? That's in, the emphasis on in practice. And then second, uh, I love how you highlighted the unintended consequences component of this, because I think that's critical. When we do this, what are the unintended consequences? And so this is where uh, the title of the book, the play in words really comes out. And a big part of the book is to say that the idea of valuing the community, of the community having control over the things that are happening in their neighborhoods um, is um, uh, in some ways, a symbolic and political construction, this idea of community. It's not obvious what that is, who that is, and what that means. And so basically, the book from almost beginning to end is giving examples of how the process plays out and how the idea of community is, is constantly evoked. Everyone talks about wanting to represent the community, value the community, talk on behalf of the community. And yet they're talking about very different people, very different groups and very different things. So it's worth thinking about um, uh, then the sort of the plan words then is how the development that happens in communities is about constructing community, but also like theoretically constructing the idea of community. So how does this all work out in practice? How does this work? So when we talk about, in particular in the US, um, how do urban policymakers talk about valuing the community, incorporating the community? Well, generally, the way that it works is, okay, there is, say, a vacant piece of land, or uh, in the case of one example from my book in Upham, the neighborhood of Upham's Corner, a abandoned um, former mattress factory. So it was a light industrial building. It um, was a mattress factory at one point, and a uh, mattress factory went out of business, and um, it had been uh, tax foreclosed. So the question for me was, how does this all unfold in practice? Uh, and I think one example that I talk about in the book, which was this former mattress factory, um, exemplifies the, the problems of when we just blanket say, let's value the community and we'll do what the community wants or incorporate them into public decision making. So this was a building in Upham's Corner, low income neighborhood in uh, uh, the larger neighborhood district of Dorchester in Boston. And it was a tax foreclosed former mattress factory. So it's a pretty big spot of land. Um, this uh, particular space was a focal point of a neighborhood planning process that was thinking about different kinds of development that could happen um, in Upham's Corner. This was a mayoral appointed group. It included some nonprofit directors, some residents, some landowners, and they were coming up with different development scenarios with the redevelopment authority on what could happen um, in the neighborhood. And this, of course, being a, a source, a, a blight in the neighborhood, um, tons of potential to be affordable housing or something else of benefit. Um, this was a big part of their work. Well, it turned out around 2012, 2013, that the Public Works Department for the city of Boston needed to move their street lighting storage facility. It was at a lower neighborhood in the city in the neighborhood of Hyde Park. And they figured, hey, the, this is a tax foreclosed uh, um, former mattress factory, which means that the city owns it. Let's just put our street lighting uh, storage in there. Um, a few residents that live around the neighborhood caught wind of these plans and were like, uh, no, we do not want a street lighting storage facility in our neighborhood. There's so much potential for something else. They bring their concerns to this um, uh, uh, planning advisory group. That planning advisory group sort of speaks on their behalf and says, again, by, from some nonprofit directors speaking on behalf of the community, these few residents, it was about a handful of folks, and says, no, stop, we cannot have a street lighting storage facility, this should be something else. And they were successful in that, that the uh, city government said, you know what? Yeah, mea culpa, we messed up, our bad. Um, the community has spoken. We should, uh, you know, respect the community and, uh, you know, involve them in figuring out what we should do instead. Okay, great. Uh, to Neil's point, this is absolutely better than, say, 
60, 70, 80 years ago, when the situation would be government would just bulldoze a neighborhood, do whatever the hell it wants. Um, and there was not that sort of level of community participation. That was not a norm in politics or in urban politics. The fact of nonprofits that are now um, much more, uh, uh, for better or worse, professionalized, so they have a bigger voice and are able to advocate on behalf of those residents, that wasn't the case that time ago. So if we stopped the story there, awesome, great worked well. The system works in some ways, right? This norm of valuing the community, which frankly people share, not just like regular people, but government officials as well. It works. So the problem then was, okay, community, what should we do? The way that the system works in the ideal form is for at that point, the community, meaning unclear, meaning some version of those particular residents that um, raise the fuss. Maybe it means the people of the neighborhood. Maybe it means people who show up to meetings, right? It's varied. So something about those, that something of the community needs to have a position, right? What they want that then can be juxtaposed against city government, a potential developer or whatever, right? In order for the community to control what happens in, uh, uh, on that site, there needs to be a community, the community, singular, right? Uh, and so what happened next? Well, the, again, the process works, so it assumes that that's the case. And then um, city government hosted then some meetings to figure out what happens. So the, the way the process works then is, well, how do we figure out the community's singular position? Let's host a meeting, invite some people to show up. Whoever shows up will represent the community and tell us the community voice. At that particular meeting that happened um, for the Maxwell building, a local nonprofit organizer raised his hand and said, hey, I don't think we should be doing uh, figuring out this right now in this meeting. We're, we represent the community. We're the local nonprofit. We should guide our own process, develop our own process, a community process, and we'll help you figure out what the community's voice is. City officials say, yeah, okay, that, that'll work. Again, that's the system is the local community nonprofit does a community process to tell us what the community wants, right? That word is being used constantly. So that nonprofit does that process and about 30 people in a neighborhood of thousands show up, um, which in some ways is fine. Not everyone necessarily cares and that's okay. You don't have to care. But again, it's 30 people uh, that those people then get divided up into groups of three. The community organizers say, okay, let's talk about in our groups, let's, let's chat about what we want to see, let's think about what we don't want to see, and then let's come up with some community consensus so that we, the community, can control what happens. So about an hour uh, of conversation, and afterwards, community organizer stands in the front of the room at a social service nonprofit where this was being held, has a big poster board up and starts writing down what people say. So what do people want to see at this abandoned factory, the space there? Uh, a few acres of land. Um, uh, they want to see affordable housing. They also don't want to see affordable housing. They say the neighborhood has a concentration of poverty. It's a low-income neighborhood. We should have mixed income housing. They want commercial development for jobs for residents. They also don't want commercial development because it brings in trucks, which will pollute the neighborhood. Uh, they want a park or a playground for the kids in the neighborhood. Uh, the community also doesn't want a park or a playground in the neighborhood because we already have a ton of them. And so, and I'm not exaggerating, uh, I'm being, it was kind of jarring how it was just not going to happen. In some ways, though, that shouldn't be jarring at all. I am by far not the first ethnographer, urban sociologist, sociologist at all that would tell you that any given group that we call a community, whether it is, whether it is a social group, a racial group, a, a, a neighborhood, people are going to have different opinions of what's going to happen around something that is like not necessarily as contentious as like national level political discussions about say social issues or whatever, right? Although even then we can be pretty divided. So um, after all of this, uh, the city government that is then given this, right? It's contradictory recommendations to inform their selection of a developer to then go through a whole other process where potential developers will pitch ideas of what they'll do. Um, long and short of it, this takes another six years 
this thing started, the field work that I talked about was done in 2013, that uh, ultimately a mixed income development with commercial development and the ground floor is currently under construction. But what I want to highlight is currently under construction in 2021, eight years later. In the interim, what has happened, the value of that land has skyrocketed. It raises the specter of gentrification because it makes it more appealing to, for instance, for-profit developers that may want to do luxury housing that may be really detrimental to the people of that neighborhood. And so one of the downsides then of how this works in process to sort of wrap it all together, to sort of put a bow on this, is that the process assumes AAA in the singular form community, the community, to have a position and the pursuit of that, it's kind of like Don Quixote, it's, right? The pursuit of that singular vision really stretches things out in the way that that pro-social impulse, that pro-social impulse, which I've, I adhere to, I agree. But when it's just sort of like, well, let's have the community decide, when it sort of just takes that for granted, takes that there will be a community, the community, doesn't appreciate the different, the different sort of perspectives that may fill into that, the different, that the community means a lot of different things. When just the sort of like, oh yeah, that's good. When that's all that the process rests on, then when it comes and unfolds in practice, it's both unsatisfying because there is no singular community uh, uh, position, but also it can be unintentionally, again, to Neil, your, your excellent uh, uh, word, I love it, right? Uh, uh, unintentionally can make things pot uh, uh, potentially um, worse for those people and for the people we care about in this case, which are often going to be the marginalized people of those particular neighborhoods. It makes it difficult to do things for them when we're spending so many years trying to find this, thing, this sort of like elusive, you know, singular position that frankly doesn't exist and we shouldn't assume it exists. I mean, I like the book because, you know, it resonates with our work on, on the communities about, you know, what you said about how it is a socially constructed and it shifts and change. Um, how much of this work, and a lot of my career has been doing this sort of stuff before I you know, joined the university, is about negotiating solidarities. It's right. constant negotiation, you know. Right. Um, but what's worrying, you know, especially as pol American policy tends to seep across the Atlantic our way, yeah. um, is the, the over, if you like, professionalization of community organizations, which uh, can cut out more local voices. You know, right. Certain people are pushed to one side in the interest of that organization. Um, I, I think that's a bit of a worry. And also, even though I have managed a pretty large, you know, community development corporation type organization, I worry about two things in particular. That organization can deliver services in one area, not necessarily another area. So there's, there's differences. But two, it undermines to a point the role of public decision making, which I think is about you know arbitration. Right. Um, am I right in this context? Yeah, yeah. And like so, and I would so here's how I would extend that um, is that is that um, there's been a few uh, sociologists in particular who study public participation, participatory democracy, who have critiqued and challenged this impulse towards consensus. And that's a lot in many ways what's what I'm picking up on as well. And what you're picking up on in that question, um, and part of the professionalization is we have urban plan or urban planners and community organizers that are in these professional organizations. And it works because we're coming up with consensus. We're negotiating, we're coming up with maybe it's a Pareto principle or whatever, like where everyone sort of benefits. But also um, the ultimate goal. And I'm focusing obviously on community, community language, and how I see it manifest in the community. And, and I want to sort of decompose that, or, you know, for lack of a better word, use a little jargon, like unpack that. Um, but part of that is driven by, I think, a, a legitimate, certainly legitimate idea about wanting to have consensus. It's better to have consensus. If everyone can get on board on things, um, uh, it works. And in fact, it's required when it comes to thinking about the interorganizational collaboration that is necessary to make any sort of community development project work. So as you mentioned, right, someone that really has a good emphasis and good expertise in affordable housing development may not be so good on maybe the organizing element or the transit advocacy element, 
uh, or the uh, sort of infra green infrastructure element, if you will. Uh, there may be funding that's available on, uh, from private philanthropy, state, city, federal government, and they all have different interests and different ideas involved there. So consensus and getting everyone around the table, getting, uh, there are so many metaphors that were used in my field work from all these different players, like, you know, getting uh, like all aboard the train, you know, I'll play on words since this was around the transit development, uh, like uh, everyone on deck, uh, like steering the ship in the same direction. All of that makes sense in that sort of professional inter-organizational collaboration to make this sort of stuff work. That same principle is being applied when it comes to things like community organizing, involving people in the local neighborhoods, getting their voices involved uh, in figuring out what they want, getting consensus there. And I think that it's in some ways can be a problem, not only because by definition, it will preclude inclusion of maybe more contentious organizations, maybe more radical organizations. They may have frankly good ideas or like are, you know, at a minimum are like advocating for the right people, the right things that like sort of everyone else cares about. But like people that aren't driven by that consensus that aren't pro as professionalized are like gonna not, are gonna be seen as a, a sort of divisive, um, um, deviant, if you will, uh, and sort of, cut out, which is a problem, but also like, and this is something that, uh, uh, you know, someone had mentioned to me once, which is that like politics is about winners and losers. Not everyone can always win in politics, especially when you have ideas that are frankly just not reconcilable. It's not a problem. We shouldn't sort of shy away from the fact that someone in a neighborhood might say we want affordable housing and someone else may say we want mixed income. We want a mix of luxury and affordable housing in this unit. Um, it's okay that they have those different opinions. I don't see why we have to pretend like they don't. And then as a result, I think it's okay to say, we think the fully affordable housing is the way to go for these reasons. And, on, and the way that often this works out in practice, um, with, and it's driven in part by the professionalization aspects of it, but also just the valuing of community more generally that assumes there's such a thing as a community, is that it sort of just assumes away the contestation, right? It assumes away the conflict. It assumes away, frankly, the politics of politics, that like some people won't get what they want. And so the question then is, how do we create a legitimate system that allows for that deliberation, that allows for those ideas to be made on the table, that allows for them people to organize around the ideas they care about, right? So I, I, um, I'm not so naive as to think that like the best idea is going to elevate to the top, right? That's not how it works. And that's not how I think it would work. I'm not you know, I can be, I have a technocratic impulse to me, but I'm not that technocratic. You know, I acknowledge that there is power differentials. There's organizing to empower certain people. And I think that should happen. But the problem is, is when there's an orientation towards consensus and not necessarily conflict or contestation, then both you're crowding particular people out, which is, I think, problematic. Um, but also you're uh, crowding out ideas and, and really, I think, making a system that is not really as effective as it could be, and frankly, not really as deliberative as it could be, right? I want more, more of this, right? Um, that I think would really make it more beneficial for the kinds of things that are happening in poor neighborhoods. So, I mean, you, you mentioned um, that, you know, one of the unintended consequences is create the creation of new mechanisms of inequality. Now that's a worry. What did you mean by that briefly, if you don't mind? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple. So um, by valuing the community and by elevating in particular community-based organizations to represent the community uh, in um, making decisions about development in poor neighborhoods, um, that's in some ways great if those organizations exist in that particular neighborhood. In my field work, one of the benefits of observing a number of different neighborhoods along this rail line, six residential and the two commercial, was um, in some ways it was bad for the neighborhood, but uh, for lack of a better word, good for me analytically. Um, excuse me, because one of those neighborhoods, oh, excuse me, um, actually the local nonprofit uh, went bankrupt during my field work. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, um, and so what happened as a result of that nonprofit going bankrupt um, is that people in that neighborhood were not able to advocate for resources on uh, their behalf or on behalf of that neighborhood. Um, and so unintentionally, by valuing community-based organizations, um, we have a situation where if you don't have one, you're kind of SOL, you know, you're, you're, you're out of luck, 
uh, it's very difficult to advocate or to implement projects. Um, and because we've valued nonprofits in many cases over someone like a local elected official, it means that even though you have a local elected official, it's not like they can actually build out affordable housing themselves uh, because we value the community so much, right? We want the community organization to do that work. And so unintentionally, um, this benefits those neighborhoods that have those strong organizations that have uh, 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 track records of success. But if you don't have that, um, if you have struggling organizations or they don't exist, there's a stark inequality between what you're able to do in those neighborhoods uh, versus the others. Mm. So do you have any suggestions how we could Im improve the situation that, um, you know, how we can overcome those mechanisms of inequality? Yeah. So it's funny, like as particularly as a sociologist, frankly, we're very good at telling you everything that's wrong about a particular situation. Uh, we love to critique, but when it comes to like, okay, what should we do now? Uh, it is a much more difficult uh, enterprise. And frankly, we often rely on a uh, very easy answer, which is generally like more public funding for whatever it is. And when I first drafted the book, my first draft con conclusion where I stepped forward and thought about some things that we can make this uh, sort of work better, um, I did just that. I was like, more public funding will sort of make this better. Uh, and it's frankly, it was unsatisfying. I had a few colleagues read it and they're like, yeah, this is very like, okay, cool. But like, A, how are you going to do that? And B, is this really going to address the issues that you um, detailed? So I went back uh, um, from the start, cut it all out and, and came up with a few other um, suggestions that I think would lead to more equitable community development, particularly in poor neighborhoods. Uh, and so I have three core recommendations. Now, these are not all inclusive of what it would take, and they're more driven by the particular things that I found related to um, the uh, issues that I discussed in the book, right? There's a lot more you could talk about in urban neighborhoods that go far beyond just the particular topics, but I tried to keep it on what could we make these particular issues? What can we mitigate those inequalities? How can we make things a little bit better? So I have three. Um, the first one is somewhat ironic, since I write about the massive growth of nonprofits, in particular professionalized nonprofits, of all their consultants, of these intermediaries that pull together private and public grants and then redistribute them to local nonprofits. It's this whole sort of system. Um, I have a, a network graph that barely can sort of scratch the surface on how complex these relationships can be um, in the book. And so I, it's ironic given that, that one of my key recommendations actually would be for more nonprofits, in fact even though it feels like we're inundated with them. Um, cri critics from the left often call it the nonprofit industrial complex, that it's like so over-encompassing. Um, but I think we should actually have more. But in particular, we should have more of variety of different types. And so, Neil, you brought this up earlier, where there's sort of a crowding out um, of particular ideas, uh, particular insights. And I think this happens with uh, more professionalizations that it crowds out certain organizations. And I like the idea of having more, a lot more, and more that have varied uh, expertise, maybe those that are focused more on organizing rather than the development side. The there's the technical side of this work of financing, um, getting tax credits to build housing, and then the sort of thinking about ideas from people um, so those things of uh, separating those out and having a number of different organizations, and then they can come together, organize together, come in coalitions around shared issues when those topics come up. So let's say there's something about the environment that comes up that they can get together and advocate for, uh, uh, for instance. So ironically, more nonprofits, I think, would allow for situations where we don't have singular organizations representing entire communities that are actually much more varied in their interests than having one particular organization represent them in, in urban governance. The second one relates to this, which is, okay, if you want to do that, you want to fund more nonprofits, well, how are you going to do that? Where's that money going to come from? And that's where I think um, institutional philanthropy has a really important role to play. So recently, uh, private philanthropy has, has um, uh, been talked about a lot more in the public, um, thanks in part to some really great high profile books. And one book in particular that I found really foundational was um, Rob Reich's book. He's a political theorist from Stanford. Uh, it's called Just Giving. 
another book with a play on words uh, in its title, uh, thinking about giving and justice and what would make private philanthropy more democratic. In some ways, the very existence of philanthropy, of wealthy people that are able to park massive amounts of money tax-free in foundations, use that money to influence public policy, is by definition a threat to democratic governance. Boom. And I think it's a really profound point. He says, okay, what can we do to make this more democratic? Um, and part of that, he says, is to use philanthropy in ways that um, governments or the state is maybe unwilling or unable to do. So for instance, for philanthropy to fund risky ventures, those risky things that for government, they're like, look, we like sure bets. We want to focus on stuff that we know is going to work. You know, we want the most qualified applicants to be where we, where we give this government grant to. For philanthropy, they have a lot more flexibility. Um, recently in the U.S., Mackenzie Bezos, recently divorced from uh, Amazon titan Jeff Bezos, um, uh, has given out blank checks to a number of nonprofits, uh, historically black colleges and universities, just said, here's millions, hundreds of thousands of dollars, just gave out $3 billion, like it's nothing, right? Um, is a much better example of the way that philanthropy can play a role in democratic governance without being a threat to democracy. So rather than playing a, 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 an influence, fund risky bets, fund things where you may not already know that it's going to be successful, fund things that like, who knows, and that given that tracking if that particular project or plan or, or initiative works or not, can then inform governance, sort of the way that uh, uh, Rob talks about it, and I found very uh, compelling was to think about philanthropy as like an R&D for uh, public policy, rather than like influencing public policy, determining public policy, being government instead of government, be the R&D wing, um, where government maybe doesn't have enough funds to be able to do. And so I think that's a space where changing the way that philanthropy thinks about funding social and economic development organizations by funding a broader range of them can tie in with that first point, can reduce some of those inequalities about which neighborhoods get resources. So that example I gave you about Mattapan, that unintended consequence of valuing community-based organizations, is that if we focus on those organizations that are the most have high capacity, are going to show success, we know if we give them $100,000, they'll do a good, a good project and we'll have results, we'll be able to talk about it, um, that's great. Funders in my study often did that. They focused on those that were going to show success. They would have annual reports where they'd show those successful projects and like, look what great stuff we, we did. I think instead, philanthropy should think about themselves more in that R&D perspective and say, you know what? Mattapan, where the nonprofit went bankrupt, is a neighborhood that is just as... Um, uh, uh, could use social and economic development projects just as much as these other neighborhoods, but just doesn't have the startup to get it going. How could we make that work? And putting massive amounts of money into that. There's precedent for these sorts of things, but it's just not part of the day-to-day -day of philanthropy. They'll, they'll do it sometimes, and there's like high-profile cases of where that happens, but it's just not how it works. The, the other sort of related piece to this um, is that to do that, I think philanthropy needs to think and rethink how they are professionalized themselves. So philanthropy, particularly in my study, but I think this is true everywhere, um, are not doing what Mackenzie Bezos does, which is writing blank checks or writing basically checks, no strings attached checks to nonprofits. They are doing things like, for instance, the Boston Foundation had an Excel sheet. They would have all these criteria, would have weekly check marks of fulfillment, like capital T technocratic grant obligation fulfillment that their grantees would need to fill out. And so that whole system privileges a certain kind of grantee, privileges a certain kind of project that fits in that Excel sheet framework. And for things like poverty, for things like inequality, for things like elevating the political voice of marginalized people, an Excel sheet that's saying how many people you brought out to a meeting or counting widgets is just not really going to be a, a really effective way to go about things. And so on that point for philanthropy to do this, I think, important role where they can play a better role in democratic governance, be that R&D side of government, I think it's going to mean really rethinking and perhaps abandoning technocratic evaluation metrics and often quantitative evaluation metrics for their grantees. Um, I think it puts things in a silos and it really limits things. You want to follow up on that? Number three. 
Point three. Finally. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the final piece, which relates to this big community side of things, is um, rethinking public participation and rethinking how we generate and get ideas from marginalized people and elevate their political voice. Right now, the way things work is as I described the Maxwell meeting, which is you send out an invite, you bring people out to meetings, you see what they say, and then you slap a, 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 a we did it, you know, a mark on it and say the community voice their opinions, the community process happened, whatever. As I discuss, that obscures all the sorts of diversity, obscures all sorts of conflict. Uh, and I think it's detrimental to really getting good ideas on the table. So I think we really need to rethink this idea of the community meeting, and in particular, thinking about the idea that the community should control development. And what does that mean? I think it means thinking about more innovative techniques and processes that are geared towards conflicting ideas, lots of ideas, and are not circumscribed by the constraints of a public meeting set in a particular time and particular place. Two very quick examples of this from my field work were a public art installation where people um, went to this big board that had popsicle sticks and had a bunch of different ideas with cups in them. And they could talk about what kinds of development was placed in where they're thinking about doing some work. They could put their popsicle sticks as they were walking by, as they were commuting to work, as they were playing like kids on the street. Very fun, very generative, um, geared towards getting a lot of ideas and not getting towards consensus, like a ton of ideas. Another one is more uh, uh, online based, which are a great idea um, that's been developed and applied elsewhere called wiki surveys. It's basically an algorithm where it's almost like a game where you're placed, you're given a question and you're given a couple of different examples. It's a forced choice and you pick which choice you'd rather like to see. So for instance, you can have a development uh, and say, what would you rather see at this particular development? And you sort of pick and choose and you can uh, put a lot of different answers in there. And then it aggregates a rank order, it put, spits out an algorithm, puts it into an algorithm and gives a rank order. What's great about that? It's not about consensus. It's about ideas. It exists to get more ideas, not to narrow into a single idea. It doesn't assume there is such a thing as the community voice. It assumes there's a lot of community voices to incorporate. And then I think fundamentally the best piece about this that makes things more conducive to uh, something that feels more democratic is that it forces transparency. When you have a list, when you have either a, a popsicle sticks or online an algorithm that gives you and populates a list, even if that top choice is not what, say, city, state, or federal government, whoever is controlling a particular project wants to do, they can say why, and they're forced to say why. They can't hide behind this community process. They can't say, well, the community voice, and here's what we got out of the community process, a way that is just fundamentally not verifiable because the community can mean so many different things and it's never specified. These processes, I feel like, force that transparency discussion and I think could lead themselves to better organizing of local groups around the things they think would be best and make things, I feel like, a little bit more... Um, uh, uh, sort of make things more explicit mm -hmm. and avoid the kind of community talk, community language. It obscures, I think, um, getting good ideas on the table that would be best for people, particularly marginalized people in poor neighborhoods. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I think, I thought, as I said earlier, the book is, is fascinating and, and very important because a lot of the ideas you surface, I mean, you start to trigger me in so many ways, thinking back on my, on my career. Um, you know, there are very important things that need discussing. Uh, and we shouldn't take things for granted. So I think you've done a, a great service with this book. Uh, Paul, appreciate it. final words? Yeah, th thank you very much indeed, Jeremy. And I think, you know, one thing to note is just the phenomenal fieldwork effort that was involved in producing this book, you know, four years, but all the observations, the informal conversations, the richness of the insights that you're able to, to tease out are really uh, fantastic. And so thank you very much for, for speaking with us and sharing these broader insights about uh, community and some of the problems of having a really well-developed uh, civil society sector. So thank you very much. Thank you both so much uh, for those excellent questions and allowing me to talk more about the book. Uh, I really appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Thanks.